Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our third week of Old Testament survey. And before we begin, let, let me open us with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that your will has been true since the creation of the world. You are unchanging, and we thank you that you have given us the record of your creation and your relationship with your chosen people, the Israelites, and that we have been adopted into that family. We pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, teach us in this time as we look at the uh, last four books of Moses. May we learn from them, may we learn more of you through this study, and may we grow closer to you because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, last week, two weeks ago we did an introduction. Last week we dealt with the book of Genesis as the, uh, the first four great events in the prehistoric prologue, creation, fall, the flood and Babel, and then we look at the call of Abraham and the start of the Hebrew people. So today we want to move forward in the Pentateuch. This, by the way, is one angle of Mount Sinai. Um, where we saw it was from a little bit further to the right. We didn't walk over quite this far. Um, off in that direction is where St. Catherine's Monastery is. But um, so today we want to look at the rest of the book of the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. They are called Torah in Hebrew, which means instruction or law, Pentateuch in Greek, or the five books or five-part book, quite literally. And as we looked at it last week, these five books, Genesis, we talked about last week from creation through the origins of God's people to Egypt. Um, relates Exodus, which we're going to talk about all of these next four today, but we'll spend more time on Exodus. It relates God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt and establishing of his covenant law. The Leviticus sets forth the laws of worship, especially the Levitical laws of worship. You know, there are moral laws, like the Ten Commandments, but then there are Levitical laws, how they were supposed to lead worship and uh, things like don't eat bacon and shellfish and various other things. Then Numbers relates to the wilderness wanderings. I'm sorry, am I blocking you here? Is that... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I think I'm moving to the back. I'm oh, right through me here. Uh, and then finally, Deuteronomy, which literally means the second law. It gives the law to a new generation after the first generation had died out in the wilderness because of lack of faith. The new generation, before entering the promised land, were given a retelling of the law. So that's... These are the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Torah, or Law, as it's known. When they talk about the Law of Moses, they're talking about these five books. Uh, law can mean all of it. In fact, there are a total of 613 commandments. There's not just 10, there's 613 in these uh, the books of Moses. They're called the mitzvot in Hebrew. And so we're going to get into that a little bit. Any questions about where we're going? Okay. Let's talk about the book of Exodus. We believe, traditionally, the author uh, is Moses. I agree with that. I believe Moses is the author of these books, despite all of the documentary hypothesis that we talked about at the end of the first uh, lecture. Uh, people have come up with all sorts of different reasons why they think Moses didn't actually write these, but always they do it based upon premises that we don't think are accurate. Like they don't believe there are such things as miracles, they don't believe that Moses would have been able to write, which we now know unequivocally is not true. There's a lot of examples of writing in Egypt before Moses' time. We believe it was written somewhere around or circa 1446 to 1440. The theme is God's deliverance of his chosen people and the giving of the law. A key word for this book would be redemption. We think of redemption as being what Jesus did for us, but God also redeemed his people by calling them up out of slavery in Egypt making them his people by giving the law. And the purpose of the book is to show God's faithfulness to his covenant and giving and, and then to give directions for living. There are really two big parts of this. There is the exodus, and then there's the giving of the law and all that means. So an outline would be introduction of Moses and then his uh, being called to from self-appointed exile. First he's introduced, then he goes into exile for 40 years, and then he's called back. The story of the plagues or the conflict between Moses and Pharaoh in, in Moses' effort to get him to release the Israelites to, to leave Egypt. The actual exodus as they left and are being chased by the armies of Pharaoh. And we'll see some images here. 
and that includes the crossing of the Red Sea. I don't actually like photographs, but we have <laughs> some images. <laughs> then the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, and then finally the creation of the tabernacle in the wilderness and the instruction for worship. All right. Here's another way of looking at that, uh, breaking it down by focus, and as I say, the redemption from Egypt, which is you know, God's redemption to his people, and then the revelation from God, which is the giving of the law. Um, the divisions, need, the, establishing the need for redemption, the preparation for redemption, the redemption of Israel, and the preservation of Israel, all of that has to do with getting out of slavery in Egypt. And then, revelation of the covenant, that's the giving of the law, and the response of Israel to the covenant the wilderness, as they begin to prepare for the wilderness. The topics, subjection, when they are under the, the, uh, the Egyptians, then redemption from that, and then instruction. 430 years they spent in Egypt. We only hear about the last 40 plus years of it with Moses there. But since the time that Joseph had gone down into Egypt, and then Jacob and the rest of his whole family all of the Israelites had come down into Egypt. At first they were very favored. And then as we're going to see in a few minutes, there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. That was 430 years later. Well, not quite that long, but it was 430 years total. Then two months of their running for it uh, and being protected by God. And then 10 months of their uh, experiencing the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, etc. And then the travel um, after that. You all will stop me if we get into any questions, right? Does so that make sense so far? All right, let's look at some of the verses that give us the major events in Exodus. First, let's look at the oppression of the Israelites. This is Exodus chapter 1, starting with the 8th verse. Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. I keep saying it the King James way, there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. In other words, Joseph had been second only to Pharaoh in ruling the country, but that was also meant 400 years earlier, and later on the rulers, they're looking around saying, who are these people, and you know, why do they seem to have a privileged rank, so we go from there. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we, have to de we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the, the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. Girls didn't tend to be problems back then, and they could be used as workers. Um, I love the fact that Shifra and Pua, their names have come down to us over 4,000 years later, um, that the, these two midwives. And of course, if you know the rest of the story, Shifra and Pua did not do what they were told. And when the officials of Pharaoh came to them and said, what are you doing? All these babies are being born, and we told you, you know, kill the boys. And they said, well, you don't get it. The Hebrew women are much hardier, much stronger than the Egyptian women. And when they call us to come and help deliver a baby, but by the time we get there, the baby's already been born in the field. We no longer have control of the situation. And that was their excuse for why they couldn't actually kill all of the Egyptian boys. Um, so... This is the setup in terms of the oppression of the Israelites. This is the thing from which they needed redemption. Okay? Questions about that? I will mention one thing too here. The tradition, and you may even have heard this, is that Ramses the Great, which who was the, one of the, his reputation was that he was one of the greatest of Pharaohs. He actually wasn't. His father was much greater, and all Ramses succeeded in doing is spending all the money that his father had. You know, but he built all these grand monuments, so that's why people know about him. Um, because it says that the two cities that the Egyptians were forced to build were Pithom and Ramses, it's been, it, people have said, well, it must have been Ramses who was the pharaoh at that time. Well, every indication is that it was not Ramses. Ramses, two things. Ramses was not an unusual name at that point. Ramses the Great was not the first one that had it. Um, and 
In addition to that, the fact that that was the name of the city as given here is no indication that that was the name of the city originally. I'll give you an example of that. If I were to say, you know, two of the people who were originally responsible for building the church, that you know, the little chapel church, were Joe and Bill, that would make sense to you. If I said two of the people who were responsible for building Union Church were Joe and Bill, you'd go, what? Right? It makes sense for me to refer to it by the name you know it by. Well, that church was originally called Union Church, but most people now don't know that. And so when, when you're talking now, people refer to it by the name people would know now. The same thing is likely true here. It later was, the, this town was renamed Ramses. It had a different name earlier. But the fact that it's being referred to later, it would not be unusual for them to use the, the name that people would have known at that time. Make sense? So this is no evidence. In fact, I believe uh, Tutmos IV was probably the, or Tutmos IV would probably have been the pharaoh then. We may get into that a little bit later. I, I, won't, I won't bore you with too many of those details. But um, the, and you'll notice that Tutmos or Tutmoses the fourth, Moses, was a family name. And so it's very likely that if he had a, an adopted stepbrother, Moses could have been his name, you know, our Moses. So, a lot of other things there. Yes? So they didn't build those two cities, they just like made store cities out of those two well, cities? Well, they were, they were storage cities. Um, they, store cities means that's the whole reason they existed. Uh, they were built in the desert as a place where they could store things. Um, rather than, you know, they hadn't been in closets yet, so they had whole towns that they used to store things. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but the idea is that there were places, because they're talking about gathering grain, primarily the storage thing, and grain is a big issue that comes out in the, in the uh, that was the reason that Joseph became so powerful. Because he predicted, you know, uh, the Pharaoh had a dream of seven fat cows, and then seven lean cows came up out of the river and ate the seven fat cows, and Joseph uh, interpreted that dream as saying it would be seven years of plenty, and then seven years of want, you know, drought and everything else. And what that means is you better get ready during the seven good years. You better save your grain and stuff. The reason why Jacob sent his, his sons down to Egypt is that Egypt was the only place that had grain, and they only had it because Joseph had created these storage centers. And so that was the way they would do it, is they would store it all in one place and then guard them and protect them. Okay. And in this case, there were two more store cities that were built by the Israelites. Yes? So about the, uh, the Moses, the Tutmos. Now, what did you say there about our Moses? Well, it's, po it's possible the name is linked. You know, there, were, there was a, a series of the pharaohs called Tutmoses. Tutmoses IV is the one that I believe probably was the pharaoh of the Exodus. And would have been therefore the stepbrother of Moses if he was adopted by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. Because Thutmose the fourth would have been the son of Thutmose the third, who probably was the the uh, Pharaoh we're talking about here, the one that really was oppressing the Israelites. And then his son was the one who became Pharaoh during the time of the Exodus, because this covers you know uh, more than forty years. So the uh, royal family would have named Moses, Moses? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's not a Hebrew name. Um, okay. It's an Egyptian name. I mean, he came in as a baby. He was adopted as a yeah. baby. And so they would have made him. Uh, and they didn't know his parents. They found him in a basket. Right. So nobody would have. His sister, Miriam, watched all this happen and came up and said, I know somebody can be a wet nurse for you if you want. And they said, that's a great idea. So she went and got Moses' mother to be his wet nurse. But neither his sister Miriam nor his mother would have said, oh, by the way, his name is, because they couldn't identify themselves as being the, the child of the family. Right. Makes sense. Okay. The Pharaoh's daughter knew he was... He was a Hebrew child, but didn't know his name. Right. You know, or anything else about it. Okay. Um, so, we have Moses uh, being adopted. I'm, I'm skipping over some of those pieces early on. This is from Exodus 2, the birth and preservation of Moses, we'll get into that. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, so Moses was of the, the tribe of Levi, the house of Levi. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. 
When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Remember, all boy childs are supposed to be killed. But when she could no longer, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Her sister stood at a, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. This is Miriam. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. When the child grew old, and I, I skip here a little bit. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Um, so... Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses, sounds like to take out of water um, in, in Egyptian. Okay? So this is how Moses, born, saved from being killed as the Hebrew children, the male children were supposed to be, and then ended up in Pharaoh's house. Then we get to the next phase here. I'm giving you a number of things to kind of set up the whole scene, which is the flight of Moses to Midian. Midian is an area we know of as Arabia now. Okay, that's across the Gulf of Aqaba, as we call it, from the Sinai Peninsula, which was part of Egypt, over into what we know as Saudi Arabia. That Saudi Arabia was Midian. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at, his hard, at their hard labor. He knew that he was Jewish at this point. He knew he was Hebrew. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one, uh, he, he asked the one, he asked the one in the wrong, sorry, that wasn't reading right to me. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. This is called the Well of Moses. If you visit St. Catherine's Monastery, which weirdly enough is right next to the traditional location of Mount Sinai, inside St. Catherine's Monastery, there is a place that's called Moses' Well. It is a well. And it's the traditional location of where Moses went and sat down. He asked a woman to draw water for him. He ended up, you know, meeting her dad, her father, marrying her, and becoming the shepherd uh, or flock. You know, it wasn't just sheep, but uh, caring for the animals that his father-in-law Jethro owned. And he did that for 40 years. He was 40 years old when he started, you know, when he, when he fled to, to Midian after killing the Egyptian. He spent 40 years there, and then after he came back to, uh, to Egypt and led the people out, he spent 40 years with them in the desert and then died at the end of the desert time before they crossed over into the Holy Land. So, according to that, Moses lived to, to be 120 years old, right? In three 40-year periods. All right, so he's in Midian now. He ends up living there in a very modest circumstance, going from being the adopted son of the most powerful family in the world to being some of you care for animals. And while he's out doing that, from chapter 3, the story of the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is the same as Mount Sinai. It's the same mountain. It's a different name. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. This was the call. Immediately following this, um, well, I've got that passage here, so we'll look at it. So this is the burning bush where God makes his presence known to Moses and calls him out. And we continue here, um, 3, 1 to 14. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. 
So I will come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, the same. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of our fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. I am who I am in Hebrew is Yahweh, you know, Y-H-W-H. Remember when they wrote Hebrew, like any ancient language, they didn't use any, any vowels, it's all consonants. It's called the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name, and it means, quite literally, I am who I am, or um, the indication is there are no qualifiers. I'm not dependent upon anything else. I am self-sufficient, self-sustaining. I am who I am. Nothing else affects me. Right? This is given as the proper name of God. So Moses goes down to Egypt in obedience to God, although he, he, there, he has other complaints. He doesn't speak well, and he says, you know, but I don't talk very well. I can't do this. God finally said, okay, I'll send Aaron, your brother. He can be the spokesperson. You'll be, you'll be leading. He'll be the spokesperson. And Moses kept saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, but, yeah, but, and God finally just said, go, and Moses finally agreed to go. So he gets down, yes? Uh, the Jethro, father-in-law, right. what kind of priest was he? He was, well, a priest of Midian um, would not have been a Jewish priest at that point, because the only Jews were the people who were the descendants of Jacob at that point. They hadn't spread out in other places. So what, I'd have to to go back and look. At one point I probably knew, but in terms of what they worshipped in Midian, they, the belief, and I agree with this belief, uh, the belief of a, moder a lot of modern anthropologists and sociologists now is that humanity actually began as a monotheistic uh, religion. I mean, the, the first human religions. Now, the, the, for the last 200 years or so, the belief has been that humans were polytheistic. We worship many gods based upon, entirely upon what our experience of the natural world was. You know, we heard thunder, we saw lightning storms, you know, and we come up with deities to re represent all those floods. And that, so we started out polytheistic. And then later refined it, that, that monotheism was a development out of that. Well, more and more anthropologists are beginning to believe that maybe humanity, and this is consistent with the book of Genesis, we started as monotheists, believing in one deity, and then we degraded into polytheism, and then God called us back out of that. That's why the revelation to the Jewish people. Okay? It's the first monotheistic religion that we know about. Um, so it's possible that in, you know, in, in this time that there was sort of a monotheistic religion in Midian. Um, or they may have, it may have been polytheistic. I don't even know. I'd have to look it up. So when Mohammed came, mm -hmm. do we know what the people in Arabia were? Were they pagan? Well, there were Christians, there were Jews, there were pagans. Uh, one of the things that he had the most trouble with, and Muhammad had the most trouble with, was the polytheism of that day. The, um, the Kaaba, you know, that black stone cubicle, uh, cube that they have in Mecca, that originally had been filled with idols of different gods. And the story, according to the Quran, is that Abraham and his son Ishmael, not Isaac, cleared out all those idols and set it up as a place where they would focus on the one god which was the God that was then revealed to Muhammad as being, uh, as, as being the one true God, all right? So they were polytheistic. In fact, the reason why Muhammad had so much trouble, he and his followers had so much trouble with the people of Mecca, and initially in Medina as well, but Mecca is because it was kind of a big tourist draw for people who would come there to worship different gods. You know, it was a big, that, that was a major industry for them. And so when he comes in and starts preaching and starts getting quite a few converts to this monotheistic belief in, um, in, God, in a God, in Allah, uh, they didn't like it. Same, the same thing that happened to Paul in Ephesus, you know, when he starts converting people to believe in one God and all of a sudden people who are making and selling 
silver idols for, of Artemis are losing their livelihood. And so it becomes a, a, a similar kind of story in that regard. But there were also Christians and Jews. You know, that's why the Quran talks a lot about Christianity and Judaism. And not with any anything negative, really. Um, the belief was that both Judaism and Christianity had been revelations given by God, but that the people who followed them had then messed them up. They had corrupted them. And so now it needed to be corrected. And that's what what Islam was supposed to be. Okay? How do I get out of all this stuff? Uh, so, as part of the back and forth argument that Moses had with the Pharaoh, and by the way, how is it that Moses got to just walk in and talk to this guy who's the most powerful person in the world at that time? Well, if he was a long displaced family member, that might make more sense. Okay? I, I, that, to me, that's one of the indications that this was the connection, that he was the stepbrother of the man who is now Pharaoh. And so he would be able to go in and talk with him. Um, even though he'd been gone for 40 years, he comes back and they, you know, he's, he seems to have open access. So they argue back and forth, and Moses is saying, let my people go. You all know the old spirituals. And finally, as the final thing, and Mo God tells Moses, warn him, you know, it's not going to go well for him if he doesn't. If, and Moses started saying, well, yes, and then he'd think about it and go, no, 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 forget that. We're not going to do that. Finally, there are the ten plagues um, in, against the people of Israel. First, the Nile turns to blood. Then there is the plague of frogs. Uh, then of lice and gnats, of flies, of disease on the cattle, of boils and sores on people and animals. Then hail destroys the crop and the cattle. Locusts come and destroy the rest of the crops. There is darkness over the land. And then finally, the death of the firstborn. The death of the firstborn of every animal and of every family including the old son of Pharaoh. At that point, Pharaoh says, get out of here, leave. You know, I don't want to see you anymore. And they leave, and then he starts collecting his thoughts, and he says, what in the world have I done? I have sent off our whole workforce. The Egyptians did not like to take care of animals, especially. I mean, they, you know, obviously they didn't like doing heavy construction, but they didn't like taking care of animals. From the very start, the Hebrews had... had been appreciated because they come, came in and they took care of the herds. Moses was doing something that his ancestors had done before him and caring for herds. So Pharaoh decides, well, I gotta go back and get these people. Let's chase them down. And we get, in fact, I'm gonna jump ahead. This is what he was faced with. This is a relief that is engraved in the outside wall of the Temple of Karnak, which is in Luxor, what used to be called Thebes, and this would have been probably Ramses, because Ramses was the, the one who built the Temple of Karnak and the one who, I told you, he built all these monuments. He spent all the money that his dad had made and made the country very wealthy. And so this two-horse um, chariot would have been an example, a whole army full of people like this, chasing the Israelites when Pharaoh said, what have I done? I'm let our whole workforce leave. Let's go back and get them. And so this was what was coming up behind them after the, the Israelites ran for it. Okay? Um, and it, this is huge. It's a, it's, I wasn't up close. This is, I don't know, 25 feet tall, this image, or 30 feet tall on the wall, uh, out in the exterior of the Karnak, Temple of Karnak. If you ever have a chance to go to Luxor in Egypt, uh, have any of you all been there? Okay. Well, there's the Temple of Karnak is the smaller of the two. It's pretty extraordinary. But then the Temple of Luxor is the big one. And I mean, they've got they've got columns there as tall as our tower outside. It's just astonishing um, and the, the size of this. So, but this is what they were facing, and so this is the response. The crossing of the Red Sea. They're being chased. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back from, with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last night, uh, during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites.
Israelites, the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. So this is the miracle of the Red Sea. And again, the chariots, this has been obviously a topic of so many works of art. This is an example of the Israelites pulling themselves up out of the sea after the water had rolled back. There have been a number of movies. We all know that Moses looked just like Yul Brynner, or I'm sorry, Charles Heston, not Yul Brynner, Charles Heston. Yul Brynner was different. Uh, that, you know, Charles Heston was a lookalike for, um, for Moses. But my favorite is this one. You'll notice uh, Moses Tranport cautioned Joseph's bones because when they left Egypt, they took the bones of Joseph, their ancestor, with them. Uh, you see the sign? It's like a vehicle with waves of water at the top for the next four miles. Um, and then Gary Larson. Moses as a kid. <laughs> His glass of milk. I love that. These are images that I use. There's one of the talks that I've done, and it's online if you're interested in it, a whole uh, lecture on Moses the Israelites in crossing at the Red Sea, and I use some of these images. Never, now, never pictured Moses that choking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With acne and buck teeth, too. Yes. <laughs> you never know. This is the traditional route. And now, the exact route that they took during the Exodus is not known. There are half a dozen different ideas. Some of them have proposed that they actually went north. This is the Delta. This is where they started from. That they may have gone through some of these areas, and that's where the crossing of the Red Sea. Some have been crossing either the Great or Greater or Lesser Bitter Lakes. This one proposes that they cross the very north end of the, um, the Red Sea here. And that then they came down, they named several places, and then Mount Sinai is here. This is the traditional location of Mount Sinai today. If you visit Mount Sinai, um, St. Catherine's Monastery, one of the oldest monasteries in the world, where they found the Codex Sinaiticus, one of the most important of the ancient and most ancient of the texts that we have used for our modern translations of the Bible. Fascinating place. They've got an extraordinary little museum there. And you can see um, the burning bush. You know, they have a bush which is huge now. I mean, it's taller than this the ceiling here, which they claim was the original burning bush. Our old pastor, Earl Palmer, used to say, when you hear something like that, you have to go, well, one wonders. You know, <laughs> meaning we can't completely discount it because it could be true, but we don't know. And then later on, that they travel north here uh, and wander around for 40 years and then ended up going this way. Now, there are other ideas about that. Again, there's been a lot of controversy. One of the more recent theories, which I'm inclined to believe, <laughs> to be quite honest, is that they did not, that down here is where Mount Sinai is traditionally considered to be that that actually isn't the location on Sinai. That what they did was they traveled through the wilderness across the Sinai Peninsula, this whole big triangular thing is the Sinai Peninsula. They crossed at an area called Nueva, and that they crossed over into Midian. Now it says, you know, remember, Moses went to Mount Horeb, which was Mount Sinai, and he was in Midian. Midian clearly, according to scripture, was what they called Arabia. It was not Sinai. Um, there's a passage in Galatians 4.25 that says, Paul says Mount Sinai was in Arabia. Now it's possible all of this was being referred to as Arabia, but we don't have, that's not indicated elsewhere. This, this is Arabia over here, okay? Um, there is one area, this is the Gulf of Aqaba. You know, Elat, or Aqaba as it's called today, is here. And this is all very deep. But there is one area here in the Weba where there is, where the water is much shallower. And there have been, I've seen the images of it, there have been a number of different um, archaeological teams that have gone there with divers and they've taken photographs of what appear to be chariot wheels and other kinds of artifacts in that area. The problem is they're not allowed to remove anything. And they're not allowed to do research on this side because, you know, Saudi Arabia is the most fundamentalist, people don't realize that because they're an ally of ours, they're the most fundamentalist Islamic uh, country in the world. 
They practice Wahhabism, which is the most, you know, women are still not allowed to drive. They have, you know, you, you live in Saudi Arabia. And uh, Wahhabism is the same basic theological approach that ISIS is founded on. In fact, there has been a great fear that, that if ISIS were able to get the common, you know, the general public in Saudi Arabia on their side because they basically follow the same religious beliefs, they might overthrow the royal family in Saudi Arabia. And because the royal family is the one that's been keeping a lid on all that for so long, uh, because of the wealth that they, you know, they, when they, after they found oil there. So they haven't been able to do any research really on this site because Saudi Arabia is not real anxious for anybody to prove that Moses, the founder of the Jewish religion, you know, got received the law there and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You can understand. There is a peak here called Jabal al Laws, or the Mountain of the Law, which has a, a burned peak, a scorched peak which that could have been Sinai. They could have crossed here in the way up, gone to Mount Sinai there, received the law, and then gone up to Elat, and then over into you know, the wilderness wanderings. Again, they can't prove it because they're not just, just like the same problem they've run into with search for Noah's Ark. Uh, the locations where it's supposed to be are in places that are, the governments will not allow ready access to. It's very difficult to get in there, and you're not allowed to remove anything if you do go. So this is possible. Uh, I'm, even though we visited there, and it's a great place to visit, Mount Sinai and, and Catherine's, um, St. Catherine's Monastery, um, there seemed to be more and more evidence uh, accruing to suggest that Mount Sinai may have been in, in Arabia, which was ancient Midian, rather than in the Sinai Peninsula. Okay? Just interesting. Doesn't change anything one way or the other, it's just interesting. So far um, as women not driving, mm -hmm. I love that because I work, I was assigned a driver. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but then you had to wear long sleeves and hot weather, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are other restrictions too. Scarves and yep. all that. Um, okay, so on Mount Sinai, when they, received, when they got to Mount Sinai, after the destruction the crossing of the Red Sea of the, and by the way, this was the Gulf of Aqaba, it's still considered part of the Red Sea, all of this is the Red Sea, so that's why it would have been consistent to say they were crossing the Red Sea still, it's just one arm of the Red Sea. Um, they got to Mount Sinai, Moses goes up on the mountain, it's called up on the mountain by God, and the people are kept down below, and they, um, they receive, or Moses receives for the people the law, and of course, the basis of the law, Kind of the, the high point of it is the Ten Commandments. These are the ones that got carved on stone, you know, and then later Moses broke them and God had to give them another set because Moses' frustration with the fact he comes back down off the mountain and people are worshiping a golden calf. Which makes sense because one of the most popular uh, deities in Egypt where they've been living for over 400 years was Horus, who was presented in, with the image of a, of a cow. You know, uh, the face of uh, Horus is the face of a woman, but with cow's ears, you know, sort of a cow's head and ears. And then, so the idea that the people looking for comfort would have built a golden calf and worshipped it, Horus was considered one of the most gentle and genial, you know, the idea of cow, sort of gentle figure. And so that may have been why they chose the golden calf to worship after leaving Egypt. So the Ten Commandments. First, and by the way, Catholics count these differently. The Catholics count number one and number two here as, as the same. And number ten, they break up into do not, the covets because it says don't cover, you know, your neighbor's wife or house or, you know, whatever. Uh, and so they break it up differently. But this is the standard Protestant way of looking at it. No, you will have no other gods before me. You will not worship, uh, make or worship idols. You will not misuse the name of God. This is why the Hebrews would never pronounce the proper name of God. They would use Adonai or sometimes Elohim, which means generic God or Lord, um, but they would never say Yahweh. In fact, we don't even know for sure that's how it's pronounced because we don't know what the consonants, the uh, vowels were for it. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not covet. The interesting thing is, is it appears that this is broken in two halves. The first five are seen as being uh, relevant to our relationship with God. The second five, our relationship to our fellow human being. And you'll look at number five, oops, sorry, and say, honor your father and your mother. How's that relationship with God? Well, who gave you your father and mother? Your father and mother represent the authority figures in your life, and so therefore represent God's authority in your life. 
honoring your father and your mother is, is a way of showing honor to God. So half are related to our, uh, our dedication to God, half to our relationship with other people. Now, following this, following the Exodus and the giving of the law, chapter 25, this is much later, the building of the tabernacle and Ark of the Covenant. Remember, they don't have a land yet. They don't have a temple yet. They don't have a city yet. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this, tab this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four golden rings for it and fasten them to the four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark in the, t uh, the put in the ark the testimony which I gave you. That's the Ten Commandments, the tablets with the law on it. Now. What's a cubit? <laughs> it's an old joke. Um, a cubit is the most ancient measurement uh, that we have. The Egyptian cubit, at least. Cubit has existed in slight di slightly different dimensions in a number of ancient cultures. The biblical cubit is basically 80, 18 inches. That's a foot and a half. So whenever you hear 100 cubits, that's 150 feet. Okay. Um, you can do the calculations pretty easily. So, but cubit is a very ancient measurement. God gave very specific instructions for all of this stuff. In fact, it continues on, and this was, God gave them instructions that the tabernacle, and I'll show you some photographs here in a minute, uh, some other images. The tabernacle was to be built with a, uh, a fabric surrounding, and then inside it were to be the tent of the tabernacle, which was where the holy and the holiest of holies were. Later on, those would be locations inside the temple when they actually settled in Jerusalem and various other things. And the 12 tribes of Israel were to array themselves around this tabernacle as represented here whenever they camped. And of course, during this time, the presence of God went before them in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night so that it could be seen. And at night, this pillar of fire coming up from the tabernacle would give an indication of God's presence, His glory present in the center of all the people of Israel. This is a drawing of what it might have looked like. Again, it had a gate, it had fabric. This was the tent of the holies. There was a laver or sea, which was uh, for ritual washing. There was uh, a place where uh, over, built over fire where they would burn the offerings, there was a place for the sacrifices to occur, etc. Not that big. But this is the most important part of it. This is the tent of the tabernacle. Um, there was the holy place, which is where the priests would go in and prepare offerings for atonement, etc. And then the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant and the law was. This is where it was believed that the presence of God resided. This was quite literally God's home on earth. And so the pillar of fire, I think I've got, yeah, the pillar of fire at night would be directly over that part of the tent of the tabernacle, the holy, holiest of holies, right over the Ark of the Covenant, you know, what was called the, you know, the, um, the seat of the Ark of the Covenant there. Does that make sense? And so this is what it would be like with the Israelites arrayed around this center tabernacle. It was like a portable temple, is the, is the way to think about it, okay? Very specific instructions, very specific instructions about how it was to be used. This is what, this is a representation of what the Ark of the Covenant would have looked like with the two cherubim on top, stretching their wings toward one another with the gold rings on the sides um, and the acacia poles. Here's a, an image of one of the high priests wearing the, the chest plate that the high priest was to wear. The, the uh, Uman and um, thir the Thuman and Urim? Urim. Urim and Thuram. It's got two names. Okay. Um, and 
strange words. So they are worshiping in the presence of God, they believe, as represented in the Ark of the Covenant. They're not worshiping the Ark, they're worshiping the presence of God in the Ark. Okay. Questions about any of that? And this, of course, is what Indiana Jones was looking for. <laughs> Later on, as they traveled through and they were called to fight, uh, fight military battles, the Ark of the Covenant would be carried with them and they believed gave them victory because it represented God's presence with them. So there's a lot of art representing that. These would have been the Hebrew people with the priests blowing the, the shofars and you know the ram's horns and things of that sort. This, um, you'll notice the city's on fire back there. This is what they did with when they entered Jericho. You know, uh, the first major city that they came to when they crossed over the Jordan River into, into Canaan, into the Promised Land, was the walled city of Jericho. You know, they walked around it every day for seven days and then walked around it again and blew the horns and the walls fell. Well, the, the Ark of the Covenant was present with them during that. So this is the story of the Exodus. Exodus literally means exit. It is the story of God's redemption. He redeemed the people out of their slavery and captivity in Egypt. And throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament, God speaks through his prophets to the people and he says, I am the Lord your God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, who brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. That became the mark that proved that they were the chosen people of God. And then, once they had been brought, uh, redeemed out of slavery, God gave them his covenant in, in the form of the law and instructions for the tabernacle and all of that. Now, Abraham was the father of the Hebrew people. Moses, because God spoke through Moses in giving the law, was the founder of the Jewish religion. Right? There was no... In fact, people who think that the whole of the Old Testament is law and everything else. For 500 years, between Abraham and, and Moses, there was no law. There was no Jewish law. The only, only thing that, that Abraham had been told is, follow me, go where, I, go where I take you, and I'll be your God, you'll be my people. And then later on, he added all of the males who were part of your household, meaning both Jews and, and slaves, etc., are to be circumcised. They are to carry on their physical body a sign of the fact that they are part of the chosen people of God. There weren't any other rules at that point. Not for over 500 years. Until God gives the law to Moses. That's when the Jewish faith, the religion, begins. That's what happened at Sinai. That's why Moses is always called the lawgiver. That he was the father of the Jewish faith. Whereas Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. Make sense? How did they get that building altars? Did, didn't Abraham build? Altars? Yeah, but all religions had altars in those That's days. Where they got okay. Exactly. That's yeah, they would they would sacrifice animals. Sacrifice has always been part of religious beliefs. Again, Molech and the Baals, etc. They sacrificed even animals, but even people. In the case of Molech and some of the others, the children would be sacrificed to them. So the idea of sacrificing to gods was common, and so the building of altars. In fact, it got confusing when, when they crossed over into the Promised Land, and after they fought all the battles and everything, two of the tribes said, we want to go and live on the east side of the Jordan. And they said, well, okay, but you have to let you, first you have to help us finish conquering the Promised Land, and then you can go. They did so, and they went back, and as they crossed over, before they crossed the Jordan, they built two stone sort of altars there. Now, they built them to God as a, as a dedication of faithfulness for Him preserving them and allowing them to move this land. But when the other Hebrew tribes heard about it, they thought they were building altars to some other god, <coughs> that they were doing something against God. And they were ready to go to war against their own you know, fellow tribes. Uh, and they said, whoa, 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 no, that's not why we built these. We built these as a way of saying thank you and dedication to God. And they said, oh, in that case, okay. But that's an indication that it was very common in those days for them to build altars to different kinds of gods. Right? Questions about any of that? Again, this is a real quick survey, summary. And we're spending, we spent more time on Exodus than we will all the other books. Uh, okay, let's get started back. We now want to talk about the book of Leviticus. Again, this is the third book of Moses, as it's called. We believe, um, I accept the traditional estimate that he was the author. 
We believe that these books were all written while the events occurred sequentially. They were probably all written about the same time, during the wandering in the desert, for instance, or somewhere along their travels, because Moses died at the end of their travels before entering into the Promised Land. It's not like they got settled into the Promised Land and he, you know, pulled the lever on his recliner and sat back and had a cool and you know, wrote his story. They were in the desert when this is all going on. So somewhere around, again, 1445 to 1400, the theme is explanations of the law and sacrifice. Whereas the Ten Commandments are almost entirely having to do with moral law. Observing the Sabbath is a moral law in one way because it had to do with the, the moral right of people to have some kind of rest. That was revolutionary. Um, Jesus was critical of Pharisees because he said, you've taken that particular law, the Sabbath law, and you've made it a burden on people. You know, you've made it about what they can't do instead about the fact that they can take a break once a week. And so in that, to that regard, the fact that it respected people and their need for some rest, you know, it's, it's as moral as don't, killing people, don't kill people or don't lie about people. But that was the moral part of the law. But the rest of it, the, the other 603 mitzvot, had more to do with the ritual. And so Leviticus is about explaining the detail of that. Uh, the, so explanation of the law and of the sacrificial system, the key word here is holiness. How do you be holy? Well, this is how you have to act to achieve holiness. To instruct Israel on how to be holy and to be a blessing to others was the purpose. And you can look at the, the very broad outline here, and it gives you a clear sense. The first seven chapters are about how sacrifice has to be done. It outlines the different kinds of sacrifice. There were sacrifices that called for animals to be sacrificed. There were grain sacrifices. There were, uh, there were libation sacrifices where they would pour out liquid, uh, oil, or wine. Um, all, some of them were entirely consumed. Some were... Part were kept by the priests, in some cases some of the people were told that they would retain some of the meat to eat and give some of it to the priests. So all of those different kinds of instructions are all contained in the first seven chapters of Leviticus. Then we have instructions to the priesthood, chapters 8 to 10, what their roles and responsibilities were, you know, how they were to conduct themselves. Then we have definitions on, from chapter 11 to 15 of what constituted clean and unclean. Um, the, the kinds of animals that are clean and unclean, the kinds of furnishings that were clean and unclean, um, when people were made unclean, if you know women during their menstrual period were unclean, well, at what point did that uncleanness start, and how was it dealt? You know, when did it end? Um, there are very specific instructions if somebody begins to have a lesion on their skin. Um, Certain kinds of diseases were signs of uncleanness, especially leprosy. That's the one we know most about. But there were some kind of things like if it was just acne or, you know, just, just you, know, you have a rash, no big deal. And so there are instructions for what to happen, what they should do when they find some sort of mark on their skin. It's to be examined by a priest. And if it's white and flaky, then they go into, then they, they follow this process. If it's dry and, you know, and all of this various, very specific kinds of instructions on all that stuff. Then chapter 16 is about the Day of Atonement, the one day a year in which they would seek atonement for their sins from God. Atonement is not a concept that, that arose when Jesus came along. There has always been an allowance for people to atone for their sins. The Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, as it's called in Hebrew, um, still they still acknowledge it. It happened two and a half weeks ago. Was Yom Kippur this year? It's part of the in the fall period. The, the season of high holy days and Yom Kippur is the most important of those. Uh, Passover, Pasach, which is in the spring, is the start of the season of well, it's actually the you know, the start of the harvest season because all this is oriented around an agricultural society. And then the uh, Yom Kippur is part of the fall high holy days that sort of bridge that period of production or farming um, that the people experience. But the Day of Atonement was the most important of all of the days because it was when your sins were atoned for. And quite literally, you know, you saw in the tabernacle there, there was the holy place, which was the larger outside area where the priests would go. And then there was the Holy of Holies. Only one person was ever allowed to go in the Holy of Holies, whether it was in the tabernacle or in the temple, and that was the high priest. And he went in there one day a year. That was on the Day of Atonement in which he would offer a sacrifice of blood, you know, on the mercy seat, as it was called, the top of the Ark of the Covenant. 
and would, you know, for the sins of the people. And there were other things, the scapegoat, which would be, you know, a goat would be identified to carry the sins and driven off into the wilderness and die, and that's where we get the term scapegoat. Um, so there's all sorts of detail in this kind of thing, but when that, it's interesting that because the people knew that they were sinners, they knew they were sinful, and that the high priest was going into the Holy of Holies to represent them, to seek forgiveness for their sins, nobody else could go in there, there was always a fear that he wouldn't, that God would strike him dead, he wouldn't come back out. You know, that they, God would say, nope, not going to forgive you this time. There was a period of time in which they used to tie a rope around his ankle, so that if God struck him dead, they could at least pull his body back out. Um, so, you know, very specific kinds of instructions. And then the laws for daily life. What you were, uh, the last 11 chapters are how you were to conduct your life in a way that reflects the holiness that you practice in your religion. Okay? Again, a different way of looking at it. The first part of it is about sacrifice. Um, what, what you needed to do to receive atonement or forgiveness for your sins. And then sanctification, how you became holy. So the laws of sacrifice and the laws of sanctification, um, all of this was given, the book of Leviticus was given on Mount Sinai, uh, the, whether he wrote it down then at that time or in the, in the time period following, and it's about a one month period in which he's capturing all of this stuff, when they were at Mount Sinai and then immediately following. So Leviticus is not the sort of book that you, you know, he probably would sit down and do your devotions out of very often. Uh, there's some wonderful stuff in there. But it is a book about very specific rules and how to follow those rules. And, you know, and, and some of it is very foreign to our mind when it comes to details about sacrificing animals and all that kind of stuff. But this was critically important because it was the set of instructions for how to live the way God wanted you to live. Okay? Questions? Not, not so much the, the exact specific requirements, but the thinking behind it. it isn't it all connected to at some place or at some point to something in the in the New Testament where you, you it's like the fulfillment of right that yes in fact the people say how barbaric you know that they were they would sacrifice these animals and spill all this blood and it must have been you know there were times when they sacrificed ten thousand bullocks in the time of David and you're going holy moly imagine how blood how much blood there was from that. And so that's so foreign to us, and people say, oh, that was so primitive in, in ancient times, and so much, so good that we're not into that sort of thing now. Well, as Christians, we actually are. The thing is that the requirement for sh blood to be shed for the forgiveness of sins, the whole, the whole first part of Leviticus, the sacrificial system, and all of that, um, the reason why they had to continually, the, the animal had to be the purest animal they could find, no spot or blemish. It had to be the very best in order to be worthy of being sacrificed to God. But because he still wasn't perfect, even though it looked good, it, they knew it, the animal still wasn't perfect. There was no perfect living thing. And that it, because it was still an imperfect sacrifice, the sacrifices had to be repeated. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the idea was that blood would have to continue to be shed until someday they could find the perfect sacrifice, which would be a sacrifice once for all, and then they wouldn't have to keep finding more sacrificial um, animals. Well, there's only been one perfect. Um, and that is Jesus. And the fact that he willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed for his body to be broken and his blood to be shed for us, it's not that we did away with the idea that there has to be a shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. Blood represents life. And life had to be given to pay for sin. But the fact that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, he made it so that we didn't have to keep doing it anymore. You know, he, the perfect sacrifice... He accepted it on himself, so we don't have to keep repeating that thing. But we're under the same rule that they were. There must be shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. And it was. And people say, oh, that's just gross and macabre. And what, you know, God must be an awful being. Well, the alternative to sacrificing those animals was sacrifice you for your sins. So it was a mercy by God that he allowed the animals to be sacrificed, and then an even greater mercy that he gave the perfect sacrifice to allow for the forgiveness of sins for all time without additional blood having to be shed after that. So, those same rules still apply to us. Those same rules about what it means to be holy. Jesus said, I did not come to do away with the law. And he means all this. He said, I came to fulfill it. Amen. The Levitical law, you know, the moral law is still impinged, you know, it still impinges on us. We still have to follow the moral law. It's still not okay to kill people, to lie about them, to steal their stuff, to commit adultery, etc. Those are to worship other gods, etc. Um, 
So those moral laws are still in force for us. What Jesus fulfilled when he said, I'm the fulfillment of the law, he fulfilled all the Levitical practices. The part of the law that was the priestly law, which included the sacrificing of animals. You could eat out of a bowl that had a lip. You couldn't eat out of a bowl that didn't have a lip. You could sit on the stool with four legs. You couldn't sit on the stool with three legs. I don't even remember if those were the accurate things, but they were <laughs> like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and all of that minuscule stuff, Jesus came and said, none of that part matters anymore. Because I've done away with that because I am all you really need. I have fulfilled all that. Whereas previously, that was the sign of being holy. And as much as anything else, it, it, people were holy because if they were obedient. If they followed all those rules because God gave them the rules, if they were obedient, that led to holiness. Unfortunately, there were so many rules, nobody succeeded at that, really. And so there was the shedding of blood to forgive them for the sins that they committed because they couldn't do all the holiness things. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, is it also he fulfilled that we didn't have to go through a priest? We could go direct to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, um, a direct he access to God. Priest. What's that? He is our high priest. He is our yes, priest. he is our high priest. So we still have a high priest, but it is sure. Jesus. <laughs> um, we do not have a high priest who is who yeah. is unaware of our needs, but rather one who's been through everything as we have, yet without sin. Scripture says. Okay, the third book, another one you don't often do your devotions out of, the book of Numbers. Um, Moses, the author of the same basic period of time, this, it's called the book of Numbers because there are two places in here where the people are counted. There are census uh, taken of all of the different people and of the history that occurred during this time of the wandering. Um, the Numbers is the time period when, when they were wandering in the desert. The purpose of it is to show what can happen when God's people rebel against them. And you remember the story. They, they leave Mount Sinai and Moses sends 12 spies up into the Holy Land, or well, the Promised Land, at Canaan. And they to scout out the land. And they come back and 10 of those spies say, we don't stand a chance. They have walled cities like Jericho, the people are huge, they outnumber us, there is no way we're going to be able to successfully take this land. We should just stay here. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said, absolutely not. We serve the God who is the master of everything and he can make us victorious. Now they did prove that it was a land, as was described earlier, flowing with milk and honey. They said they brought back clusters of grapes so large they had to be carried on a stick between two men. You know, so there was a lot of produce there. Again. When you see pictures around Jerusalem or whatnot, it doesn't look very, very fruitful. But if you get down toward the, the Mediterranean Sea from there, the Valley of Sharon, very fruitful, very good. And they've now irrigated the Negev Desert, which is part of what the, uh, the Jewish wandering was. So they're growing crops there now. The Israelites, uh, the Israelis, they're not called Israelites anymore. The Israelis have been very successful at that. So anyway, the result of their lack of faithfulness was God said, fine, if you don't trust me, if you don't believe that I can take you into the land, then I won't take you into the land. And so they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. The reason was, for 40 years, is that's how long it took for every one of the male leaders of the family units to die, with the exception of Moses, Caleb, and Joshua. Those were the only three adult males who were still alive at the end of the wanderings because they were the only ones who had faith that God could bring them to fulfill the promise he made to give them a land of their own. So 40 years it took for all of these men to die. And so we have the story in numbers of all the wandering around and that's what the, you know, show what can happen when God's people rebel against it. We have the taking of the census in the first nine chapters from Sinai to Canaan. The spies go in and come back and they have the rebellion and then there is, uh, you know, period of time in Moab. All of this is when they're wandering around uh, waiting for God's timing. Um, again, this kind of outline, the old generation, the tragic transition, and then the new generation. This is what the book of Numbers is about. That's why there's two senses. Um, the order of preparation, the disorder and postponement, and then the reordering and preparation. Time of giving uh, Mount Sinai, 
the time in the wilderness, and then up to the plains of Moab as they're preparing to enter in again. And this I've already showed you when we were talking about the, um, the Exodus. But this area uh, is where they're wandering around, and Moab is up here when they actually begin to go up and enter. Mount Nebo, right here, is we, um, and we find this out in the next book we'll look at. Moses, at one point, God had given him instructions, and Moses, in his anger with the people, was disobedient to God. And God said, because of that, because you're a display of anger rather than just believing me when I told you, here's what you should do and it'll be okay, God's judgment against him was that you will lead the people, but you will not yourself enter into the promised land. And so, at the end of the wanderings, Mount Nebo, God took Moses up on Mount Nebo and allowed him to look over the Jordan into Canaan, the promised land, so that he could see it, but he was not allowed to enter it. He died and was buried there. And we don't know where his tomb was. Is that I have a hard time with that, that he would not let him go. Yeah. After all, he had did. And I know it was because of disobedience and anger, but it's just so hard for me. Yeah, yeah, he was also 120 years old, so he may have accepted that as a relief. <laughs> I get to rest for a while, okay? We don't, we don't know all of the pieces of that. I mean, that's the reason that's given this, because he was not... And yet, the, the being able to see the promised land was kind of a, a, um, a secondary prize. At least he could see that God's plan was going to be fulfilled. But again, he was 120 years old, and this is not during the time of Methuselah when people were living to be 900 years old. He was probably ready. Um, so, beyond that, we don't, we don't know. We can't second guess. Yes, Mark. After his long life with God and all that God did in him and through him, it may have been also a way to keep us from worshiping him somehow or yep. somebody really special. Right. Uh, he's not without sin either. Yeah, exactly. And, and the... It's often been the case that, that um, there's always been a concern that when a major leader dies, that wherever they're buried will be a site of reverence and it actually will become a problem, either for the next rulers or just, you know, people will be obsessed with that and not, you know. So they kept a secret where Buddha was buried, they kept a secret where uh, Genghis Khan was buried, they kept a secret where Moses was buried, David's burial place, they think they have that found it. You can go to what's traditionally the burial place of David. For a long time they didn't know about that. Um, that was fairly common, you know, that they, would, they wouldn't, because they didn't want it, whether it was because he, they didn't, God didn't want him to continue into the promised land because the focus would be too much on Moses and it needed to pass on to the next generation of leadership that God had anointed. You know, we don't know all the details of that. But Couldn't it have also been a teaching moment to the entire uh, people? That right. You disobey God, there are consequences. Right, right. Don't think that just because you're a big hot shot, you get to go ahead. Right. Yeah. Um. That always uh, bothered my mother. A very great deal. Moses yeah. was not allowed to cross over. <coughs> but um, he did get to go to the uh, transfiguration. Right. Yeah, he was still around. I mean, he knew what was going on. It's not like he got shut down completely. Moses and Elijah both showed up to meet with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah, so he, he may not have been present in body, but you know, in, yeah. in spirit, he apparently was aware of what was going on. So, okay. The fifth and final book. Of the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, Torah, is the book of Deuteronomy. Again, Moses is the author. Now, because Moses, um, and, and the primary focus here is three sermons that Moses preaches to remind the people of what God expects from them. Now, within those sermons, Within those sermons, um, the law is restated. It's a retelling of the law. And the reason is because, again, remember the first telling of the law was with a generation that has now died out. All of the men at least have died out. This is the younger generation have grown up. And so this is the opportunity before they get ready to cross into the promised land, which is going to be hard. It's going to be ball fighting wars, etc. There is a retelling. And it's presented in terms of three... Um, sermons by Moses, 
the journey that they've taken being reviewed, the review of the law, and then the, the, the restating of the covenant, covenant agreement. And then the final farewells and Moses' burial. Now people, the obvious thing people have said is that Moses could not have written this because Moses could not have written about his own death and burial. Well, he could have had a, a divine vision. I think it's, it's I, I admit that that could be. It's most likely, perhaps, that the final chapters here, with Moses' death and burial, were written by Joshua. Joshua had been selected by God as the leader to pick up the, the responsibilities after Moses. He um, was a great man of God, a great man of faith. There is no shame to Moses in the fact that the last part of the five books of Moses might have been written by his, you know, his successor, Joshua. And I think that's probably most likely. The majority of it could still have been written by Moses, and then Joshua added this as, a, as an appendix after, after everything, okay? This outline, first sermon, second sermon, third sermon, all in the plains of Moab, all over about a one-month one month period of time. And again, what God has done in the past, what God expects of us now, and then God, what God has promised he will do in the future. That's what the three sermons are. And remember, all of this stuff is available online if you want to go on and find them. Um, this is a view down. It's the same picture I had last week, a view down to the River Jordan as we went along. Um, any questions about any of those five books? Yes? When I was reading about um, the vision that Peter had of the things that he said were clean to eat, what is the strangle of the animal? Quite literally, would be an animal that, that was killed without shedding its blood. Kosher law. Like a chicken. What's that? Like a chicken. Well, or with a rope. With a rope. You know, where you you would choke it. All right. The the both in Orthodox Judaism and in Islam. In Judaism, it's called the kosher laws. In Islam, it's called halakha. And in fact, it's been a big controversy in England for some time now that um, that. There's such a large uh, Islamic population there now is that a lot of stores are promoting, even like fast food places, will say all of their meat is prepared halakha. You know, it's it's uh, it's prepared according to the Islamic rules. And one of those rules is that an animal must be all of the blood must be drained out of it because people are not supposed to eat the blood. That was one of the that's one of the rules both in Islam and in Judaism. And so, if you strangle an animal, then all of the blood stays in. You know, if, if you, in, in effect, and this is why it's been a controversy, the, the ritual way of killing an animal uh, that's considered to be clean is you cut, a, and you cut an artery while it's still alive and let all the blood flow out. Because if the heart's not still pumping, it, all the blood doesn't come out. You know, you guys have watched the detective shows. You know, if, somebody, if, if somebody dies and then they suffer a wound, that wound won't bleed because there's nothing pushing the blood out. So part of the rule is the animal has to be killed in such a way that the, the blood exits the body. And so that's why a strangled animal, which would still have the blood inside of it, was not considered kosher. Okay? And that, that list of unkosher animals, I mean, there's certain kinds of birds that are okay and certain others that aren't. You know, it, it's certain kinds of lizards are and aren't, and it's very specific. Kosher laws. I had a friend of ours, a Jewish couple, a friend of ours here in town. Um, I don't think they're particularly observant, but we invited them one year. We used to have our Easter sunrise service at Hole in One. You know, the, it's now called Sunrise. But we'd have the outside service, and then because we had a kitchen there, we would make uh, we have pancake breakfast. It would be pancakes and bacon. And so I invited this Jewish couple to, to join us, and I said, um, yeah, come and join us. And, and they're very easy going. I said, come and join us for the service. And afterwards, we have pancakes and bacon. And, and he, he went, oh, the Jewish dilemma, free bacon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah, it's, it's not something a lot of Jews worry as much about anymore, but uh, those who follow kosher law still do. As promised, as we go, one dilemma. Yeah, exactly. What's the dilemma? I actually, strangely enough, um, people get weird ideas about that. I was leading a two-day workshop in Knoxville, um, Tennessee, one time, and one of the couples had come from Florida to take this. They're they in charge of a ministry down there, a rescue mission. 
And being Tennessee, they, the snacks, they, they, they came in and we had sort of a buffet breakfast kind of stuff. And it was sausage and biscuits and gravy and, you know, stuff like that. And they did that both mornings. And the second morning, the, the man, um, and they're Protestants, they're not Jewish. Uh, he, I asked him, he said he wasn't from a Jewish background. He said, we really try to eat kosher. And so having sausage is not appropriate in a meeting like this. And I went... Really? <laughs> you know, I mean, you may not like sausage, but to have a religious objection to it um, for a Protestant is kind of a strange thing. So, I'm from Tennessee, so I thought it was great. <laughs> no, no problem at all. So, sausage and biscuits and gravy, that's just the best. Um, grits. Oh, you know, oh, I, yes. I, we were too poor for grits. I think, you know. <laughs> we didn't grow up eating grits. It's not uh, not something that, and I don't know why, you know, grits, polenta is the polite word for it, it's, it's the same thing, basically. Um, my oldest brother, though, who did grow up eating grits, because he's quite a bit older than I was, lives in Obama, he was traveling with a friend of his one time through the South, and he, they stopped at a restaurant for breakfast and they had grits on them, and he said, my brother said, grits, I haven't had grits in 30 years, he said, Oh, you got to try some grits. And his friend said, that doesn't sound very good. He said, I'll have one grit. If I like it, I'll order some grits. Okay, so we're getting into the joke telling part of the story. Um, other questions? That's, yes? Um, in Genesis 9, I think, uh, yeah, 20 to 25, that was where Ham uh, found Noah naked. And all Drunk, yeah. And what did him do that was so bad? Was it the fact that he saw his father naked? Or was it um, that he went and told his brothers what he saw? I mean, yeah. what, what exactly did he do? Well, the suggestion is he walks into his father's tent and his father is, is, has gotten drunk and is laying there naked. And the polite thing is... And this has been true in even modern cultures. You know, you, you walk in on somebody naked, oh, you know. Uh -huh. There's no indication that he did that. And so the suggestion is he was showing disrespect for his father. And then he came out and talked to his two brothers about it in a way that apparently was disrespectful because um, Shem and Japheth, their response is to take a cloak between them and to walk backwards into the tent mm -hmm. so they're not looking on their father's nakedness and they drape it over him. So they responded to the situation with a great deal of respect and honor, even though father got drunk and was laying there naked. Whereas the suggestion is that Ham, the fact that he talked about it, the fact that he looked at his father, the fact that he, you know, whatever, we don't have a lot more details about his response, but whatever it was, it simply was not respectful. And remember what, what commandment number five says? Honor your father and mother. And even though the commandments had not been issued yet at that, you know, at that time, this principle that your parents are given to you by God as his <coughs> representative authorities in your life, um, even, even if your parents were not very good, good parents, still there's a sense in which, while we may not always understand it, it was God's intention for them to be the people that, you know, whose family you're born into, then we're called upon to honor them, to respect them. That had always been the case, even, even you know, before Noah's time, in terms of how children respond to parents. Ham, apparently, was being quite disrespectful in not only what he did and looking at his father in there, but going and telling his brothers about it, and so he was he was judged for that. We don't have a lot more detail about what he said or what happened, but I think that had to do with it. Um, whereas his brothers went through a very awkward kind of gyration to try to keep from seeing their father, to try to keep their father's nakedness from being obvious to, to them or anybody else. Okay. Anyone else? Any other questions? Well, you get a half an hour off today because that's all I have to say. Yay. <laughs>